Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon. Um, what I actually saw doing, first of all, I'm not showing a PowerPoint, so it's, a, it's just my first day of boycotting the PowerPoint now. Um, but I'll tell a bit more what, uh, um, you know, how I um, think um, the current achievements in terms of the uh, AIDS response have be, be, were possible and uh, where, you know, that's useful for the uh, NCD response and where it may not be useful because I don't think you can transpose um, an experience of uh, one set of health problems automatically to another one. And, um, and we heard a lot about how HIV and, and, uh, and um, chronic diseases interact. Um, and I think it's particularly, uh, besides the, uh, the clinical aspects, um, that it's at the policy level that some lessons can be can be learned, and um, I'll group that under basically uh, three headings and a half: um, is on the science, on politics, and on uh, services programs on the ground, and then also on what I think are, is the weakness or are weaknesses of the uh, AIDS response, and which I think are also useful lessons. It's not all. Uh, it's, it's not that it's all. Uh, going that well, and um, um, I'm certainly not one of those who think that uh, the end of AIDS is around the corner, um, and uh, I think we can't uh, speak about success when, um, you know, there's still 1.6 million people dying per year and more than 2 million new infections. I was just in South Africa, and when the new um, data became available on the, uh, of the latest um, nationwide survey and in 2012 there were 400,000 new infections particularly among young women and uh, so it's it's less than before no doubt so that's uh, progress but uh, success I would say uh, is uh, means something else now on the science and, and AIDS um, I think a, a very important um, um, Inspiration, I think, from the AIDS movement for um, dealing with uh, non-communicable diseases, <clears throat> sorry, is that um, science should really drive what we do, should drive the response together with uh, human rights and social justice. I think you cannot walk on one leg without the other. You need both. And um, particularly human rights and, and social justice, I rarely uh, see mentioning uh, when it comes to non-communicable diseases. And yet, um, when you see who's affected and, uh, and how and why, uh, there are huge uh, social and gender and other dimensions. But also, um, in both cases, there are uh, serious uh, ideological and uh, commercial interests at stake. And um, when I was head of UNAIDS, I always tried to um, you know, to neutralize them by to say, what is the evidence? Where are we? What works? It's not up to us to, um, you know, to go into morals in the case of AIDS or to defend commercial interests. But um, it, it is really so that um, the um, um, that that should be the basis for for policy, and that's on, and that's where science comes in. Uh, in addition to um, hopefully now and then provide a game changer, which was certainly the case in uh, when in 1996, um, you know, antiretroviral therapy uh, became uh, available, uh, so-called highly active antiretroviral therapy. The problem is that the scientific evidence is not always uh, super clear, and uh, and there, um, of course, uh, we need to see what um, what makes the best sense with the. Um, with the, um, the status of science at the moment. A second um, issue that um, we're stri still struggling with in, uh, in the AIDS movement is that um, you really need a unified, uh, let's say, technical scientific strategy. When the experts are fighting with each other, you can definitely forget that any political leader uh, is going to vote for big uh, budgets and so on. And they say, please come back when... Uh, you got your act together. And um, remember when I started with UNAIDS, that's something I, I spent a lot of time on. It's not to try to uh, swipe under the carpet, um, you know, differences and, uh, and being in academia now, I know the, um, you know, the narcissism of small differences, as uh, Freud called it. 
um, and how that can uh, really, uh, you know, generate a lot of passion, and that's fine because that drives science. But um, but when it comes to putting something on the agenda, um, it's very important to say, okay, we agree on that, and that's for the time being. This is our, you know, our um, the strategy, and, and and as much as possible based on uh, on evidence. And uh, so that's the second point. Um, and third, a uh, third point I think is that um, having uh, reliable data. Um, here um, we still have a long way to go, um, and uh, when you uh, think of it, um, it's quite um, uh, you know extraordinary that with uh, health conditions from diabetes to hypertension and so on, that the uh, just the baseline data in many, many societies are just not there. When Moffat this morning presented like the whole, you know, diabetes, for example, and that it's not measured in a, um, you know, in a consistent way, etc. And without that, uh, without these data, um, it will be difficult to, to build a compelling case, but also to have baseline for, to know later on whether what we do has any impact. So, Good surveillance, I would put, it's both, it's where science and the programs on the ground come together. Now let me turn to politics, because science can be wonderful and fantastic, but if it's not getting, an, uh, you know, getting any political traction, there won't be any uh, funding, and um, it, it will be just uh, for our intellectual um, satisfaction. And on the politics, there are a few uh, also ground rules, and I think that's very that are very relevant for, um, for chronic diseases. One is a, um, you need to know what you want. In other words, you need a plan and you need to know um, what, um, you know, what your targets are. Um, and, and it should be a mix of a number of things. Um, one is, it's really key that how you position a disease. Okay, as health professionals, for us, it's a non, uh, it's another, a no brainer to say that uh, you know, we need to save lives and we need to, uh, you know, to, to deal with uh, whatever we're dealing with uh, in terms of health. That is not exactly the, uh, the way that the, the rest of the world looks at it, except when people are having that health problem themselves. Um, so it's very important to, um, you know, to position um, NCDs, I think, as we did with HIV, in a, you know, what is the economic cost, what's the return on the investment doing something about it. Not the spin doctor, um, but that's really um, essential to um, to justify enormous investments. Because let's not fool ourselves. Um, you know, controlling non-communicable disease is going to require enormous, enormous investments, um, and they're not going to just fall out of the sky. And linked to that is that we need to make sure that we come up with. Um, solutions, even if they're not real solutions. Um, just as uh, in, in 96, when highly active antiretroviral therapy came on the market, then that was considered as a solution. We know it's not the solution, it's part of the solution. But um, I've, I've repeated that quite a few times here at the, at the school, but my old professor of what was then called social medicine uh, in Ghent, he said, a problem without a solution is not a problem. You, you know, you do research, but you're not going to be able to really uh, sell that and um, mobilize money for it. So you need to, <clears throat> at the same time, when we say this is a really bad problem, you know, it kills so many people with also, but that's what we can do about it. Um, and that plan also should have a clear uh, guide on accountability. Accountability both in terms of, um, you know, the money, but also uh, all the promises that are being made, that they're being honored. So that's, uh, I think, knowing where we're going is, is really key in, in the, the political side. <clears throat> Secondly, um, it's building a coalition. You need to lose a bit of your purity when you want to really change the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it means that you've got to work with people who, you know, you may not uh, agree on everything. Uh, you may not like even and so on, but you need to agree on this is a common goal we have and we join forces and... Uh, and that is what, um, you know, can change the world. And um, I always uh, use the example of, uh, of South Africa uh, under, in the, during the Mbeki years. Um, 
then you could wonder in one of those quizzes, what brings together the Chamber of Minds, the Communist Party, the Anglican Church, uh, the, the trade unions, COSATU, um, uh, I don't know, AIDS activists and, 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 and a few others. I mean, it was that they had really formed a coalition to uh, make sure that, um, you know, the government would provide treatment to its citizens in, in South Africa and would deal with AIDS in a serious way. For the rest, they didn't agree on, on hardly anything. Um, so that coalition building is really important. And so we need to look outside our comfort zone. And then thirdly, I think, um, and that's a, again something that's an, it's an open door, but it's leadership and creating momentum. Uh, this morning, um, the um, special session of the uh, UN General Assembly, the special session on the, or the high level session, I think it was called, for non-communicable diseases and other events that uh, can not solve the problem but can create a momentum um, and particularly should be used for, to um, make uh, those in, in power to, to sign off to something so that they can be held accountable later on. Um, so that it's not just a piece of paper. And then the third um, element of my triangle, I would say, that's um, of the science, the politics, and is, are the programs on the ground you need to deliver. And uh, again, the first thing is to have a plan. Um, in AIDS, uh, we, um, we invested quite a lot of time on what are the priorities and also the, how to do it, cost it, how much is it going to cost, how many people do you need, and so on. So that's clearly um, a major in investment. But secondly, also, is that uh, we've learned that you need to really combine prevention and treatment. And I think that's the case also for non-communicable diseases. One of the reasons I left the uh, Lancet uh, group on, um, you know, on non-communicable diseases is because it was the only concentrating on, pre on prevention. And, you know, and the millions of people who have diabetes, the millions of people who have cancer and so on, uh, you know, they were not on the agenda. It was only about uh, prevention. On the other hand, what I feel with, treat, with, with, with AIDS now, we've gone too much on the other side, and it's all about treatment, and prevention is, you know, has not been um, you know, invested anymore um, in a sufficient way with the results we have. So br keeping them together is really uh, very important. Thirdly, and that's uh, something many people will not like what I'm saying, but vertical programs do work and may be necessary, particularly initially. If you really want to start up something, you need to concentrate the minds, the means, and concentrate on results. And when it works, okay, then you can see what can be integrated and what not. Um, integration sounds nice, but you can lose a lot. And uh, in the case of, uh, of AIDS, for example, on chronic treatment, I think is a clear case for integration. But what, what do you do then with, let's say, antiretroviral therapy with the drugs do you want to say, oh, that should be done by the essential drug program, with as a result that there won't be any antiretrovirals probably anywhere else, anywhere in, in the country. So one needs to think through very carefully. And in the case of AIDS, those who are most at risk, most vulnerable, are most of the time not welcome in any health service. Gay men, um, you know, uh, sex workers, drug users, or, or young women, adolescents. Um, so you need to think not in ideological term, Vertical is bad and integration is good, but to see how can we save the most lives. And that's what ultimately um, works. And lastly, I would say is to constantly learn from what we are doing, because we have to invent and sometimes reinvent uh, everything while we're going on. Now, um, uh, my last part is that about weaknesses. And uh, I think that uh, the AIDS response is extremely vulnerable and fragile. Um, for a number of reasons. One, it's often too isolated from anything else. Some people would accuse it of distorting other health resources, but um, but it's uh, it, therefore it's 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 uh, it can be vulnerable, and so we have to make sure that with NCDs also it's really embedded in in a broader. Way. Secondly, um, the neglect of uh, of prevention that we saw and. And I think that's grounded often in the case of AIDS because it's about sex and drugs and so on, but in the case of NCDs is because we have to deal with um, not only commercial interests, but also our own lifestyle. It's, uh, so it's, and the easiest is to blame, uh, you know, the tobacco companies and so on, and of course they should be blamed, or um, 
fast food and what have you, but it's really about a completely different way of, of living. And that means that it's not just taking a pill. Um, and that requires a quite a different way of organizing society and going outside the medical, the biomedical uh, framework. We need to involve sectors that are so important for um, particularly the prevention of non-communicable diseases. This, when you look at the main uh, interventions we can do in terms of no, for the prevention of non-communicable diseases, very, very few are in the health sector and are in the biomedical sector. And that's a challenge for us health professionals, how to do that. A weakness of the uh, AIDS response also is the extreme donor dependency. There are um, about 10 countries in Africa that were nearly 100% of people who are on antiretroviral therapy are, um, you know, are, you know, on drugs that come from purely are paid for by international donors. Can you still call a country sovereign when uh, hundreds of thousands of its citizens are, you know, when their survival depends on a vote in U.S. Congress or, you know, or a decision by DFID or whatever you the global fund? And finally, I think short-termism. The AIDS response suffers from short-termism. Implicitly, we thought that this was a matter of a few decades, maybe. We need to face the reality that HIV is going to be with us for generations. And that's certainly the case also for, uh, you know, non-communicable diseases. So we need to really think the long term, not to postpone what we have to do now, but to make sure that what we do today will have the best possible outcome also the long term, besides dealing with an emergency. So to conclude, I think that there are some generic lessons from the AIDS movement for any social and health movement, I would say. Secondly, we need to be realistic what is applicable from AIDS. Um, the, the big momentum for AIDS started around the new millennium when there was the economies were, uh, you know, were absolutely growing and there was more money for um, overseas development assistance, as it says, and so on. And now we're struggling to get even one mention on health in the, um, in the new the sustainable development uh, goals and it may it sounds it's going to be a process like universal health coverage which uh, is not really an, an outcome as far as i'm concerned so that's a that's a, a very, very different context and i think that um ncds are far more complex even than than the needs um and lastly so the biggest lesson for me is that we have to work on many fronts at the same time the science, the evidence, the policy and the politics, and the uh, uh, programs on the ground. And it's only when these stars are aligned that uh, we really can hope to have uh, significant uh, progress. Thank you.